morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome on this World Communion Sunday, but also this 19th Sunday after Pentecost. On this World Communion Sunday, we will symbolically receive Holy Communion along with millions and millions of Christians the world over. And we do this in solidarity as brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever denomination we are. There is an envelope in your uh, bulletins. There is an offering that the United Methodist Church asks us to do for World Communion Sunday. And this helps to provide scholarships and other educational opportunities, in part, for people that are of, of minority ethnicity. So, welcome on World Communion Sunday and also the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. It's also great this morning to see Gracie Lee with us and her daughter Kathy. I'm assuming Gracie didn't bring a whole bunch of food because every time I go to your house, I eat, I eat like I'm starving. So, so thank you for being here. It's also a great pleasure and honor to have uh, part of the Woods family here. I served the Freeville United Methodist Church for five years, and retired Air Force Major Tim Woods and his son Zeke uh, were very central uh, to my ministry there. So it almost brings tears to my eyes. Um, so good to have you here this morning, gentlemen. So. Um, with that said, I know we're live. Welcome to all the people watching live. Our greeting this morning is in your bulletin. It's on both screens. It's from Hebrews 1. I'm going to read, and you are welcome to respond on this day that the Lord has made. Christ is the light of God's glory, in the imprint of God's glory. Let all of God's children come to the light. Our prayer this morning comes from Job 2. Psalm 26, Hebrews 1, and Mark 10. They must have had a real fun time putting all those together. So, as I say almost every Sunday, the family that prays together stays together. If you're here for the first time ever, we do have visitor cards in our pews. Feel free to grab one, fill it out, drop it in our collection plate so that we know we knew that you were here. We can reach out with the love of Christ. But we are all brothers and sisters in Christ if we turn to him. And because of that, you are invited, whether online or in person, to say this prayer with me together as the body of Christ. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you spoke to our ancestors long ago through your prophets and teachers. But today you speak to us through your Son. In the midst of life's trials and tribulations, help us keep our integrity and walk faithfully in your ways. Help us listen to the words of your Son and become like children again that we may rejoice in your kingdom and trust in your Holy Spirit. Amen. Some of you might have heard, I think I heard a day ago, maybe it was the day before, our country has crossed the threshold of 700,000 uh, COVID-19 deaths. Uh, many churches for centuries have had a practice of sharing the peace of Christ, the peace of Christ be with you, the love of Christ be with you. So we are still doing that, uh, but certainly it's at your discretion. If you want to just wave, if you want to handshake, if you want to do the elbow thing. But let us, as we are comfortable, share with one another the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Job 2 and Psalm 26. 
Walk humbly before the Lord, even in hardship and pain. We will live with integrity before God all the days of our lives. Walk faithfully before our God, even when put to the test. We will honor the Lord our God all the days of our lives. Come, let us worship. And our music ministry today has been slightly changed, and we are have the pleasure of hearing Mary Jane and Dave Plummer sing a hymn. Thank you for that. You can be seated. Jack Doyle regrets not being here. I'll talk more about that in Joyce and Joyce. Thank you to thank you to the plumbers. So. He wanted me to start the song by singing the first three words, Lead Me, Lord. I practiced for what, about ten minutes? I kept not hitting the note. So he finally said, you know, Pastor, you've had a great effort. Uh, but maybe we'll try to find somebody else to, to do that. So thank you so much. So any kids that are here this morning, if they want to come forward for our children's message, feel free. And as the kids are coming forward, there's still a group of people going to Keith Clark Park after the service today to do uh, some of the weeding and some of the service stuff. Um, and I know Barb Doyle is leading that. She's going to be heading right over from Sunday school. So if you do want to go over to Keith Clark, uh, Melissa and I won't be able to make it because we have another uh, obligation. But feel free to go over there, pull some weeds, plant some flowers. And I think it's around it's around the Memorial Monument. Is that correct? Yes. So we're going to be honoring our, our soldiers and people that have served. So. Well, good morning. It's so good to see you guys. Have you 
ever had a bad day at school before? Never? Every day of school has always been good? Have you ever had a bad day ever? Or maybe you were sad or something happened? No? Well, that's good news. Wow. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> well, sometimes people go to school, maybe they don't do as well in a test as they want, or maybe they drop their books, or maybe something happens and they just have a bad day. And you know, who we're talking about this morning on the screen, Job, there's a book in the Old Testament called the Book of Job. Job had a lot of bad days. But you know what never left him? God. So if you're having a bad day, if you're having a tough time, God will never, ever, ever, ever leave us. So if it's the best day of school, the worst day of school, if your teachers are grumpy, I'm sure we don't have any grumpy teachers here, it doesn't matter because God is with you. So nothing you can do ever, 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 ever can remove God from you. Have you ever gotten in trouble with your parents before? You ever been put in time out? Oh, come on, you know that one too. Have you ever been put in time out? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Today? No. no. <laughs> so no matter what happens, God always loves us. Even if it seems really hard, even if you're having a day where you're like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this day, God is always with us. Amen? So can we pray together? All right, let's pray. God, we thank you that you are always with us through your son Jesus Christ. No matter what happens, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how great it gets, you are always with us. I ask you to bless our kids, bless their families, and may they continue to do well in school. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good to see you guys. I'm glad school's going well. <laughs> Sunday school, Miss Barb will be teaching, and I know that um, Kayla will be helping as well. So just some announcements. As I said, we have hit this milestone for, for COVID, unfortunately. Hopefully we can get this under control. I, did anybody think three years ago we'd be sitting here right now with COVID? Anybody just tired of COVID? I'm tired of COVID. I'm so tired of COVID, I want to see your faces. That's how tired <laughs> um, So... Um, just a couple announcements. Newsletters for the month of October are in the baskets on those tables uh, if you didn't get one through email or you didn't get one in the mail. So feel free to take one of those. We continue to not have coffee hour uh, because of the, the uh, surge in COVID. We're hoping at some point to have that again. We have to wait and see how things are. Our men's lunch this Thursday at 1 o'clock is at Roma's right here in Sydney. So I hope to see you there. Really fun time. Tuesday, we're doing week 40 of our 365-day Bible study. We're in the New Testament now. Most of the students in the class are thrilled about that because <laughs> they're tired of reading the Old Testament. So that'll be at 4.30 on Zoom. I have already sent out information. It's on our Facebook page. Feel free to join us, even if you've never joined before. We're going to be in the Gospels uh, this Tuesday and look forward to that. Again, it's World Communion Sunday. There's a giving envelope in your uh, bulletin. It also gives a little bit more information, like I said. So if you want to give to that ministry within the United Methodist Church, you're welcome to do that. Again, after the service, there's a gardening group going to Keith Clark Park, right um, down by River Street there. So if that's something you want to do, um, that would be great. You're going to be uh, uh, beautifying a, a monument uh, that, that honors our fallen and, and people that have served. This Thursday at 6 p.m., we're going to have our Sauce and Cross ministry. That's our more contemporary rock band worship service. We are going to have food in the parking lot. I checked Thursday. It's going to be a high of 71 with no rain. And uh, we're going to have food and we're going to have worship. But we are going to be masked up uh, during worship. So if you'd like to come worship with us on Thursday, um, I'd, I'd encourage you to do that. I'm going to be talking about what happens when things get hard, which is a little bit about what I'll be talking about this morning. It looks like on Sunday, October 31st, Halloween, I, I just had a connection, Pastor George. I don't know if you're going to come dress in a costume for our charge conference, but that would be fun. So our charge conference will be uh, Sunday, October 31st, Halloween at 5 p.m., and we are going to have our conference with some other churches uh, that will be here as well. Is that correct? Are you going to come in a costume? Uh, I wear a costume all the time. You'll, you're going to come as a... You're I'm, gonna, really, I'm really six, seven, and I'm being... <laughs> Judy said you're coming as a disgruntled minister. Is that true? Is that... Okay. <laughs> um, the other... Uh, two other announcements. Uh, today, as a matter of fact, at 2 p.m., at the Unadilla Presbyterian Church, the Classical Guitar Society of Upstate New York is going to be playing a free concert 
and any donations given will benefit the Unadilla Food Bank. I had never been in the Unadilla Food Bank until Saturday morning. Actually, Mary, who just came in, was the one who gave me a tour. It's an impressive little food bank. So if you want to go to that free guitar concert at um, Unadilla Press at 2 o'clock, all the money gathered will go to the food bank. And we have had what I'm now calling the Club 55 saga. So we have had a couple notes from the women that they were a little wild and reckless and they needed people to come in and watch over them, and this was from Jeanette. So I asked her to write a letter, Jeanette from Club 55, to the women regarding the men. And I expected a total smear campaign, but this isn't what I got. This is what it says. Thank you for having lunch with us today. It was such a pleasure to have an, a, such a well-behaved group today. Not what I heard from the ladies. What a difference from the ladies, that's what it says. Although they were much better at their last dinner, Thank you, thank you for that. Please continue encouraging them to behave. If I must be honest, there is one gentleman that could stand to sit in with the ladies. I don't want to name names, but Ron Niemeyer uh, should sit in on a lecture uh, to the ladies. You're doing a phenomenal job. We thank you all our love to the staff at Club 55. So the, the saga of that continues. So those are all the uh, announcements that I have this morning. Actually, I just remembered one more. We are updating our committees. So uh, if anybody wants to be on one of our church committees, I know this is what you stay up late at night hoping for, uh, just let us know and we will get an updated sheet out soon. So any other uh, announcements this morning? I think I gave enough of them, right? So, well, um, if there are no more, please stand with me as you're able. We're going to sing 529 in our United Methodist hymnal, How Firm a Foundation We Have in Jesus Christ. Let us stand and sing as we're able.
This morning, as I'm preaching on Job in just a little bit here, but in the book of Job, if you've never read it, I'd encourage you to, not on a bad day, but on a good day, Job goes through all kinds of torment, but nobody and nothing can take God's love from him. And I hope we have that attitude here this morning. Just some joys and concerns, prayers for uh, Christopher Doyle, for Keith Robinson, I believe Suzanne said his foot or something of that nature was hurt. Uh, Ron Creighton, who's in our choir, uh, he had a surgery and he's home recovering well. Continued prayers for Kellyanne Follett. Uh, Jack Doyle cannot uh, be here with us this morning um, because him and Cindy had a false positive for COVID-19, a rapid test, which doesn't necessarily mean they have it or doesn't necessarily mean they don't. Um, and Jack, if you're watching, you are here with us in the house of God. You're in your recliner, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so uh, it's so sad that Jack can't be with us, but he should be off quarantine well within time for next Sunday, and we're going to have a, a choir practice at 9 in the morning. Um, also, I've heard uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the, the baptism here of little Brett Lafolas. Uh, his mother, Taylor, um, I guess has COVID and, and is quite sick from that. So I am sorry to hear of these increased cases of COVID-19. I also know that Bill Dan tomorrow is getting a hip replacement, so uh, feel free to reach out with love and, and care for him. He's been in an awful lot of pain, uh, and, and that's why the hip replacement is so needed. So, are there any other joys and concerns this morning that haven't been lifted? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Someone had a birthday <laughs> on Friday. And and so that someone is by Stevens. Two people had a birthday <laughs> on Friday. Yes. And, and, and I'll tell you, I, boy, do I feel loved by this church and this community. What time did I finally get off the phone Friday night? 1030? I finally got in the shower at some point in the morning, and I had two missed calls while, I, you know, I just was trying to just find time to take a shower. We went to Club 55, Ron, Sarah, Melissa, and myself. The ladies brought out a little sheet cake, and the whole restaurant sang. Les was there, Les Gregory. I turned all kinds of red. I'm not used to having that kind of attention. And people go, well, you're up in front every Sunday. Yeah, well, I'm talking about Jesus, not me. Um, and then, and then in addition to that, Sarah and Ron gave me a new coffee maker, a Keurig. And there's a button on there where you can push it to make the coffee stronger. So you will regret that decision very soon. Yeah, sure. Sure. So, but I also know that Vi, Vi had a birthday as well. So, and, and we were the same graduating class, so we're the same age, right? So happy birthday to you. Is there anyone else? Any other birthdays or anniversaries? Oh yeah, yeah, you had a birthday. That's right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other? Okay. Church, the City United Methodist Church. 
We thank you that even through a pandemic, you're not done with us. Even through a pandemic, you're growing our church, increasing our numbers, and strengthening our ministry so that we can reach people and they can know that no matter what, they're loved. And we ask you to bless our church as well as our brothers and sisters across the street at Sacred Heart and all the churches in this area. So that their missions may be increased, the love of God may be spread, and people would know that Jesus is with them, even in the worst, darkest moment of their lives. God, on this day, as we always do, we praise and thank you for our men and women in uniform, all now six branches of our armed services. Men and women who we have seen recently administering COVID shots, having airlifts out of the Kabul airport, and doing so many amazing things and putting their lives on the line so that they can honor you, they can make their families proud, and they can stand up and say, I served my country. We thank you for them. We thank you for our police officers, our EMTs, our firefighters, our other first responders, our paramedics, our dispatchers. And we especially thank you for our incredible medical workers, men and women who have continued to do battle with this thing called COVID-19. I ask that you would put on them, as the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, your full armor so that they might go in every day and you might strengthen them and encourage them. Let our medical workers know that we are behind them. We are praying for them and we love them and you will never forsake or abandon them. On this day, God, we pray for our government. Our president, our vice president, our governor, all of our elected officials. We pray, God, that you would move in and through our officials, and if need be, despite them. God, we pray for the persecuted church around the world. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan and North Korea and other places where they are worshiping in secret because they are terrified for their lives. How blessed are we to live in a country that has freedom of religion, and we can pray here this morning without worry of oppression or persecution. We pray also, Lord, for all those who are oppressed, victims of human trafficking, people that are tricked, people that are taken advantage of, people that are not treated with grace and mercy. And while we pray all these things, we know that you are good, God. We know that you are loving, and we ask you to continue to use us to be among those who suffer. And we now lift up the great prayer that your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, told his friends nearly 2,000 years ago when they said, Lord Jesus, how do we pray? And he said, when you pray to the Father, you pray like this. Join me in saying the Lord's Prayer as a rainbow. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Pam, thanks for reading scripture this morning. Well, today, of course, we are reading from Job, which of course is quite apt for these times. And it's, uh, there are several different verses from Job. Uh, the first chapter is chapter 1, just verse 1. There was once a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. Oh, thank you. Oh, excuse me. They do have a lot of wood here at the lectern on this. <laughs> the step stool? Yeah. Okay. I always admire people. But see, they don't know that because they're not up here. No, I always admire people who are tall. Again, the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 1. There was once a man in the land of Uz. I want to say Uz, but I think Uz is better. <laughs> Whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright. One who feared God and turned away from evil. And then chapter 2. And that will be <coughs> verses 1 through 10. <coughs> One day, the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and, up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, 
Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incite me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have, they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, he is in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loads of stores on Job, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as any foolish woman would speak. And I would like to qualify that any unwise woman, because I don't think women are foolish. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> anyway, shall I receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And then in our New Testament, we have the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and chapter 2, 5 through 12. <clears throat> Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And chapter 2, verses 5 through 12. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things unto their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, from whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sacrifices and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. This is the word of God. For you, the people of God. And we have a hymn of preparation. Um, I want Jesus to walk with me, number 521.
invite you to stay standing as you're able for a reading from God's Word. This morning we have a reading from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 10, verses 2 to 16, where we talk about, Jesus talks about divorce and also talks about caring and loving for children. So I'm going to touch on the divorce thing, but I'm mostly going to be talking about Job this morning, or as one of my youth group kids said, the book of Job. Uh, so once again, Mark 10, verses 2 to 16, and this is 43 in your New Testament of your Red View Bible, also on the screen. Let us hear what the gospel has to say for us this morning. Some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is, it is to you that such that these that the kingdom of God belong. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Once again, the word of God through the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I want to make a general overarching statement this morning, which isn't true for everybody, but I think is true with a good segment of our society and Western society in general. I think that we now, in 2020, and have for a while, live in a conditional culture. Yet, we have an unconditional God. We have a God that loves us no matter what, will never turn his back on us, but many of us do things conditionally. We tell somebody they're our best friend for life. Is that an unconditional promise, or is it a conditional promise? To begin this sermon, then, I have a question for us to consider. How many of us, at some point in our life, if ever, have ever lost our faith? Or how many of us know somebody else who has completely lost their faith? We hadn't seen them in years, and they were a devout Christian. They loved Jesus. They loved God. And we ran into them, and they no longer have faith at all. They're now an atheist. They've abandoned God. They've abandoned faith. Or maybe at one point in your life, you did or almost did the same. How many of us know, or is this true for us, by a show of hands? It certainly is. And I want to talk about this morning why that is. Because, you know, the reality is I think we live in a conditional culture. And when we get married and we take those vows, I had somebody call me a couple weeks ago on a Friday and go, Hey, dude, can you do my wedding tomorrow? I said, what do you mean? Can you just show up and say a few things? No. No, I can't do that. He said, why not? I said, because I do Christian marriages. There's vows. We have to talk. You have to understand this. I don't just say a few things and we cut the cake. It's a little more involved than that. But how American is that? In Las Vegas, last I heard, there's a 24-hour Denny's, and you guessed it in there, there's a wedding chapel. Because I don't know what's more romantic as you're sharing your moons over Miami than getting married in the Denny's wedding chapel. There's wedding chapels I've heard in Las Vegas that have drive throughs because who has time to get out of the car and get married? We live in a culture, increasingly, where we make conditional agreements, conditional promises, but we have an unconditional God, which means if we decide who God is and what, is God and what God is supposed to be, and if that God doesn't pass muster, the unconditional agreement we made to love him for eternity, we can just cut that cord because we don't like the contract anymore. Anybody know anybody that has done that? or maybe will do that, we have decided in our mind who God is. 
And we have decided that God is a holy vending machine, and anything we want, we will get, and when we don't get it, it's evidence of the God who loves us conditionally isn't there at all. What did Janis Joplin say? Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Yeah, that's actually a song. The reality, the promise of God through Jesus Christ is he is with us. He is with us forever and eternity if we only claim it. But you know what? It doesn't mean life on earth here is going to turn out the way we wanted it to. How many of you, your lives have not turned out the way you wanted it to by a show of hands? How many of you thought years ago when you retired, you'd have decades of healthy bliss with no medical problems? How many of you by a show of hands thought that? How many of you 30 years ago would not think your health would be the way it is now? And is that evidence that the unconditional promise of an unconditional God isn't true? Or is it just the reality, friends, that we live in a broken and a sinful world? And bad things happen because people do sinful things. When the drunk driver hits the van and kills the whole family, including the kids, it's a tragedy. But it's not evidence that there's no God. It's evidence that we need God. And friends, I want to tell you this morning that God will never abandon you. You can turn from him and he's there. You can run from him and he's there. You can abandon your faith utterly and completely and he is there. You can have a health problem and he's there. You can have the death of a loved one and he's there. Your house can burn down. You can lose your job. Our choir director could be getting treated for cancer and have to delay his chemotherapy because him and his wife had a positive COVID treatment. Our youth director could be getting treated for chemo but still be here smiling knowing that Jesus loves her. Amen? We could go bankrupt. Our car could break. Our health could be in jeopardy. We could become a Mets fan. There's all kinds of bad things that could happen. But it doesn't mean that God is not with us because we live in a conditional culture where we decide who God is and what the contract is. And when it doesn't go our way, we cut the cord. Amen? Amen. And there are people, some preachers, some on TV, that want to let you know that when you have faith... As a result of that, you'll never have a bad day, you'll never suffer, things will never be hard, you'll never go through trials, and boy, does that sell. But it's not real Christianity. I'm not saying that God cannot bless somebody richly and take them to new heights, but we have a long track record of people that have suffered greatly. Some of the great saints of the church have suffered tremendously. Read a little bit about Mother Teresa. Not a fun life every day for her at all. But what she knew was that God was with her. And even though that was true, she had moments where she doubted. This morning when we partake of communion, which is open to everybody, we are declaring the new covenant in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is saying, no matter what happens to you, if you're in a hospital bed, if you're on a chemo ward, if you think that you're alone, guess again, for I am with you. I think I told you this story before. One of our former seminary heads in Rochester, he was preaching at our annual conference four or five years ago, and he said, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a cancer survivor. And everyone clapped, and he said, when I went in for my first round of chemotherapy, the doctor said, only you can go in and nobody else. And he said, you don't understand, doctor. Somebody else is going to be in that room with me, whether you like it or not. I'm very comforted by the words of the Apostle Paul from the book of Romans, chapter 8, 38 to 39, that I read in our service last Sunday night. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Bad things happen on this earth. People get sick. People get cancer. People die in car accidents. And I wish, friends, I had all the answers for you. Is God not still there? Does God not intervene? Of course, God intervenes where he will. But his promise is eternal. Jesus came and bled and died on a cross so that we would have the eternal promise of him. That nothing can take that from us. On your worst days, in your worst persecution, 
When you're suffering so bad you don't know up from down, he is with you. And you know what? Dictators around the world that want to limit the gospel, that want to limit the church, and want to remove it from their country, here's what I think. I think they're terrified of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And guess what? They should be. Because when your faith is in Christ, you can take everything from me. You can torture me. You can beat me. You can kill me. But you can't take Jesus Christ from me. And this morning in Job, this is exactly what the narrative is. The devil comes to God, and God basically says to Job, there are people on this earth, when put to the test, they will abandon me. But the devil, but God says to the devil, but not Job. Not Job. You can do whatever you want to him, Satan. And he will not turn. And Satan goes, if the chips are down, if things are hard, everybody will abandon you. And God says, not Job. Go and test him. And this morning, what the devil does is, you can see in the picture, covers him from head to toe in sores. And he's scraping it with a piece of a clay pot. And his wife comes out and literally says, just turn from God and die. And he says to his wife, no, I'm keeping faith in God. Now, this is an important scripture. This is one of the few times in human history where the husband was correct. So I want you to remember that. I said in church a while ago that I am right in my marriage 5% of the time. And I think that's double the national average. Is that right? So Job was correct this morning. If I was him, I would have recorded it. Because the next time his wife was probably right, he could have said, remember the source? Yeah, I remember Job. Good. I just wanted to make sure you remember that. But, you know, we live in a culture, I think, as I said, where we make conditional covenants. When I sit down to marry a couple, why do we do premarital counseling? I want them to understand what they're entering into. And this is what our United Methodist Book of Worship says. These are the vows. Will you love them, comfort them, honor and keep them in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, be faithful to them as long as you both shall live? How many of you at one point in your life said those words? When I was 22, I said them, and I probably didn't even understand them fully. I do know before we got to the vows, I said, I do. And the person said, we're not to that point yet, kid. I said, I know. I want to wrap this up. So I I do twice because before Melissa could run away, I wanted to get this thing locked up. But, you know, I've heard stories before where a man gets older and his wife is no longer as young as she used to be. So like some sort of car on a car lot, he just trades her in for a new model, you know. Or the husband gets really sick and he's in the hospital and the wife goes, you know, I didn't sign up for this. I'm leaving him. And my response would be, yeah, you really did sign up for this, though, because you said through sickness and in health. You said through richer or poorer. We live in a culture increasingly that makes conditional decisions when they're unconditional realities. The God of the universe, his love is unconditional. And I am worried, friends, that in our culture, sometimes our faith can be shallow. We can decide when things are bad that there's no God, but when things are great, there is God. Now, the example I want to give to this, for this to bring my sermon to a close, is one of my favorite movies. It's the 1983 American comedy, Trading Places, with Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy. Anybody see this movie before? Now, in the movie, which came out when I was two, I know, I'm young, I'm 40 now. In the movie, Dan Aykroyd is a very prosperous Wall Street businessman. He's got a very good life, he's got a lot of money, but his bosses, the Dukes, They make a $1 bet to say, we're going to take everything from Dan Aykroyd. We're going to take his wealth. We're going to take his stature. We're going to take his power. We're going to take his influence. I wonder what will happen. And one of them says, he will cave and fall apart. And the other goes, no, he won't. Very similar to Job, isn't it? And then Eddie Murphy in the movie, who has absolutely nothing, becomes wealthy and powerful while Dan Aykroyd falls apart. Sometimes we make conditional covenants, conditional decisions, but we have an eternal, unchanging God. This morning, briefly, in our gospel, the Pharisees come to Jesus asking him about marriage. And what Jesus says is, you know, if a husband doesn't like his wife and can just write a certificate of dismissal, what is that about? The reason Jesus rallies against divorce this morning, I believe, is what Jesus is saying is, If both of you enter into the covenant and you're serious about it, and you follow the covenant and don't break the covenant, then you should keep the covenant. 
If somebody breaks their marital covenant, it can very well be grounds for divorce. I am a product of remarried parents. I have a mom, a dad, a stepmom, and a stepdad. And when I was a kid for a few years, I got two Christmases. Not the way I wanted to do that, but it was kind of cool. So double the presents, right? So if somebody breaks their marital covenant, if they break those vows I read, that can be biblical grounds for divorce. I've never done a wedding before, and the bride said, just so you know, Pastor, I'm going to have three great years, and then the ship's going down. I don't think anybody, when they get married, believe that. When they're taking the vows, they're hoping that them and the other person will keep them, but sometimes they don't. I looked up, and you know we have a 50% divorce rate in this country? And I think part of the reason for that is, I think people get married, they enter into this, what, what is an unconditional covenant, conditionally, because they watch The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, and they're hoping they got the rose, and he's handsome, and she's beautiful. But the reality is you're entering into a lifelong covenant. And that's why I tried to say I do early when I was getting married to Melissa, because I figured she'd figure me out at some point and run away. That's why I did that. But we've been married for over 17 years. She's a patient woman. Will no doubt be made a saint one day. Thank you, Melissa. But I think so often we make conditional covenants. Or we go into a covenant and we are making it unconditionally, but the other person really isn't. They say they are, but they're not. And I think that's sometimes why we have divorce. I think that's sometimes why marriage is split up. Not because both have broken the covenant, sometimes one has broken the covenant. But friends, what we have in the book of Job is a very drawn out book of suffering. Why would God allow Job to, su Job to suffer? Well, that's a question. The other question is, why would Job break an unconditional covenant that he's made to an unconditional God? I don't know about you, friends, but I want to have faith like that. And there's a lot of times where I don't think I do. There's a lot of times where I have a bad day, and I grumble, and I struggle, and I want to be able to praise God through everything. Anybody else feel that way? Job suffered in ways we can't imagine, but he never, ever broke the covenant. He never abandoned an unconditional God. And friends, I want to have faith like that. Amen. As we prepare to come to the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, our hymn to prepare for that, written by Brian Wren, uh, the husband of Sue Hayfield, who is a pastor here. Uh, we're going to sing 617, I Come With Joy. You can remain seated for that. <laughs>
about Sydney United Methodist Church. You could be having the worst day in the world, but you're going to come here and feel so loved and so cared for. Didn't he say, Pastor George, we're like the show Cheers, or everyone knows your name? Without the bar. <laughs> but how nice is it to have a family that if you are sick, if you are struggling, you know that the people here really love you. And we are walking through life and walking through faith together. Throughout the centuries of the Christian church, there certainly have been things that have been disagreed upon. But what the majority of Christians, well over 90%, have agreed on for centuries and centuries, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, whether they're like cats or dogs, is the basic blueprint of the Christian faith. The basic blueprint of the Christian faith is that we believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we profess this in the great creeds of the church, like the Nicene Creed, and the Apostles' Creed, and the uh, Athanasius' Creed. So this morning, we're going to say the Apostles' Creed 882. It's on the screens. This is the basic blueprint of the historical Christian faith. Let us profess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Lord. Amen. I know I ask this every month, but any of us commit any sins since we last took communion? And if you went to an early morning service before this, that doesn't count. <laughs> so from, from a month ago, I'm sure we've all made mistakes. I'm sure there are times maybe we've all lost our temper. We've all maybe, you know, said or done something we shouldn't do. And it's only proper before we become, come to the table of Jesus Christ that we ask God to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So our prayer of confession this morning is 890. The first part in bold is responsive. There'll be a time where you are welcome to uh, pray in silence, go to God, reflect, and then I will speak words of forgiveness and reconciliation. So let us pray this together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Friends, in the silence of these moments, go before God and, and give to God anything that's on your heart. Dear friends, we have an unconditional God that loves us unconditionally, even if some of the people in our lives haven't done that. So may Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life, and the whole church said, Amen. As we prepare to come to the table of our Lord, we have communion cups on the tables, the disposable ones, if you prefer to take communion that way. When you do come forward, if you have a mask, you can just kind of slide it up and, you know, dip the bread, put it in your mouth, and then put the mask back down. We're going to go through the Great Thanksgiving this morning, 13 and 14, in our hymnal. It's also on the screens. Let us go through this, and then we will come to the table of the Lord together. The Lord be with you. Yes. Lift up your hearts. Yes. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, the giver of all good things, the lover of our souls, the one who loves us unconditionally. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join your unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. 
And holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the suffering baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to us, your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by the water and the Spirit. And on the night which Jesus Christ gave, him, gave his life up for us all, almost 2,000 years ago, he sat in that upper room, which we had more upper room prayer books out there if you want, in, in the hallway. He took bread, grain from the fields. He sat with his friends on that Passover dinner, and he did something new and different that had never been done before. He lifted the bread, yes, the Heavenly Father to break it, and he broke it. And he gave it to his brothers, who still did not know fully who he was, who all but one would abandon him on the day of his crucifixion. And he said, Brothers, take and eat of my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup filled with the fruit of the vine. He asked the Heavenly Father to bless it, as this is the new covenant in his blood. And he said to his friends, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant. Pour out for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And friends, this new covenant is not conditional. It's unconditional. If you turn to Christ, he will turn to you and he will never leave you or abandon you. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ offering to us as we proclaim the great mystery of our 2,000-year Christian faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ has come again. And Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit on here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And the whole church said, Amen. I'm first going to serve Sarah, and I know we have a couple of helpers. Are you, are you helping this morning, Dave? Okay, so I'm going to serve you first, and then we will invite everybody up. If anybody can't come forward, we certainly can also come to you. We also have gluten-free, too, if you need that.
Sometimes we are conditional. Sometimes we expect things from you that you didn't promise us. But let us remember that you are unconditional. You are with us eternally. You sent your son to earth for us. And your love will never fail us, no matter what befalls us. We ask you, God, to grow our offering, to stretch it and to multiply it, so that the Sydney United Methodist Church might continue to be a light in a world that's so dark, love in a world with so much hate, and hope in a world that knows precious little. Bless our offerings so that we might continue to go forth, transforming the world through the power of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.
Our closing hymn this morning, thank you, Spence and uh, Peggy. Uh, our closing hymn this morning is three, 363, and, and can it be that I should gain? Let us sing our closing hymn together as right
standing or sitting right now, we can feel the incredible love of God through the Holy Spirit. There are going to be moments in the coming days and weeks where you won't feel it as strongly as you do right now. But just because of that, it doesn't mean he's not with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is always, always, always with you. Friends, be blessed this day in knowing the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you are eternal, that you are unconditional, even when we are not. May we go forth this day and live and love and transform in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ooh.